what the title says, Mary is indeed the greatest woman who lived on this planet. However, that definitely needs to be put into perspective, namely, who is she? To begin, I'll let this section from the Catholic Encyclopedia explain itself. Quote, in the Constitution Infallibilis Deus of 8 December 1854, Pius IX pronounced and defined that the Blessed Virgin Mary, in the instance of her conception by a singular privilege and grace granted by God, in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Saviour of the human race was preserved, exempt from all stain of original sin. Unquote. Keith Thompson, in his paper, The Early Church Did Not Believe Rome's Doctrine of the Immaculate Conception of Mary, defines and explains what the doctrine is in his introduction. I would also recommend taking a look at the talk conducted by William Webster, called Mary, Immaculate Conception, Perpetual Virginity, which can be found at christiantruth.com. Now the question is, was Mary preserved from the stain of original sin? No. Cleansed later, obviously, by the meritorious works of Jesus Christ, but certainly not preserved from the state of original sin. The first abuse of the biblical text can be found in Luke 1.28, which says the following, quote, The angel went to her and said, Greetings you who are highly favoured, the Lord is with you, unquote. The word kakarta mene is used, which means highly favoured. It is often claimed that this refers to Mary's Immaculate Conception, but such is folly, as the context doesn't refer to her birth, and it does not specify a particular occasion where she is highly favoured. The word is found in the masculine, in Sirach chapter 18 verse 17, but regardless of it being masculine, it wouldn't justify the Roman Catholic's point. Here is the verse in question from Sirach, quote, Yes, kind words are more effective than the best of gifts, and if you are really concerned, you will give both." Unquote. Does this mean that the man has undergone the same thing as Mary? Well, by the Romanist standard, that is what we would have to accept if we accept their premise. Thompson notes in, in his paper, The Bible Does Not Teach Mary's Immaculate Conception, the following. He says, if the perfect participle form of the word grace in Luke 1.28 proves Mary was graced at the Immaculate Conception, then it also proves the man in Sirach 18.17 was graced at his Immaculate Conception as well. Yet the Catholics believe Mary was uniquely graced at conception in the same way Christ was. It's because of things like this that Roman writers and scholars will actually admit that this word kakarata mene does not even prove an Immaculate Conception. For example, Catholic writer Jimmy Aiken states, Jimmy Aiken's quote here, and so it's the, the Immaculate Conception, something that is consistent with and coheres with the use of the word Kukarata Mene here, but it is not something that the word Kukarata Mene requires. This is a Greek term that you could use in that exact grammatical formation for someone else who wasn't immaculately conceived. Back to Keith. Hence, although Roman writers are willing to admit that Luke 1.28 does not firmly establish the Immaculate Conception, which is correct, many others refuse to admit the obvious and, and instead stick with the debunked idea that the verse demands the doctrine. For example, William Weary asserts the Immaculate Conception is contained within the angel's annunciation. Greeting to her, hail full of grace. Back to Keith again. It is astonishing how Catholic writers who utilize more of a realistic approach admit without second thought that the verse does not establish the Immaculate Conception, since it is the best Rome has to offer concerning scriptural support for this dogma. As Keating notes, Catholic exegetes in discussing the Immaculate Conception begin with the Annunciation. Unquote. Feel free to take a look at Keith's article for more information. Furthermore, it is important to note in the context, in the very same passage that is often appealed to, what Mary says in her song to God. Observe this in Luke 1, 46-55. Quote, And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant, from now on all generations will call me blessed. 
For the Mighty One has done great things for me, holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Unquote. If Mary was immaculately conceived, why in the world does she refer to God as her saviour? The obvious conclusion is that she was a sinner, and no, it is not a profession of how God the Father or God the Son saved her. Take also into consideration what is said in John 2, verses 1 to 5. Quote, On the third day a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you... Do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Unquote. Mary asked Jesus at an, at an inappropriate time to do something, but he tells her that it isn't the time for him to do such. As Jameson Fawcett Brown notes in his commentary, quote, Woman, no term of disrespect in the language of that day, what to do with thee, that is, in my father's business, I have to do with him only. It was a gentle rebuke for officious interference, entering a region from which all creatures were excluded. Mine hour, hinting that he would do something, but at his own time, and so she understood it. Unquote. Now some reading may say, well, she simply wasn't guilty of sinning deliberately, but was only guilty of sinning by accident. However, though the Old Testament does acknowledge, as well as the New Testament, that there is a difference between willful and accidental sin, or practicing sin and falling into sin, the objection presented is vacuous and demonstrates nothing contrary to the biblical position. Moreover, it is important to note that the claim that Mary was a perpetual virgin is ridiculous and is even refuted by the words of Matthew himself. Matthew 1 Verses 20 to 25. Quote, but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and she gave him the name Jesus. Unquote. Part of consummating the marriage would imply and give way to the fact that Joseph did lie with Mary, but not until Jesus had been born into this world the context giving way also to the possibility of Jesus having literal brothers and sisters, rather than a reference to distant relatives or cousins. This can be found in Matthew 12:46 to 50 and also Mark 31 to 35. Here's the section from Matthew. Quote, While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside, wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside, wanting to speak to you. He replied to him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Unquote. And the reference from Mark. Quote, then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived, standing outside they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Unquote. The thrust of Jesus' point is not that he doesn't have a mother or brothers, but his point is, who are his true family? In particular, a spiritual family namely those who seek to do the will of God. 
The fact Jesus doesn't deny that his relatives are calling him only demonstrates the point that he acknowledges that he had siblings who were born after him. Not to mention, in a Jewish context, if Mary and Joseph did not consummate their marriage, they wouldn't have been legitimately married. You can bet your bottom dollar that Jesus himself would actually be quite offended at the suggestion of that, not to mention his parents would also be offended at that. Now we move on to the subject of prayers to Mary. To quote the words of John MacArthur with respect to this unnecessary exaltation of Mary, quote, that's paganism that would nauseate Mary if she knew about it. And she doesn't. She never heard a prayer from anybody. Unquote. I couldn't have said it better myself. Although Mary is alive in Christ, this is not a proof that one can simply pray to her and ask her to go to the Son for a request. Mary is physically dead, though alive with Jesus and the saints in heaven. However, only Jesus has the prerogative to be prayed to, and as Yahweh God, he can answer prayers. The only way any individual can ever answer multiple prayers from across the globe is if they possess omnipresence, which is something that Mary lacks. Also, praying to the saints or to Mary is necromancy, namely praying to the dead. Asking a dead person in prayer to take your request to God is an abomination. Isaiah makes the following point to his people in chapter 8 of his book. He says in verses 19 to 22, quote, When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instructions and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land, and when they are famished, they will become enraged, and looking upward will curse their king and their god. Then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will be thrust into utter darkness." Unquote. Before anyone tries to appeal to the transfiguration where Jesus speaks to Moses and Elijah, no, that is not necromancy. God the Father allowed Jesus to speak to Moses and Elijah, and nowhere in the context of Isaiah did God the Father grant such a thing to the people. It was a one-time scenario, and it fails to take into consideration that Jesus is the one who came down from heaven. Thus he would have the prerogative to speak with Moses and Elijah because of the Father in heaven allowing it. Plus, Jesus is not seeking Moses and Elijah's intercession which shoots the Romanist claims in the foot regarding this passage. There is no endorsement from the New Testament that would allow us to pray to Mary. Thompson also says the following regarding this matter in the same article I've linked to, quote, However, the biblical prohibition in Deuteronomy 18.11 is that men should not pray to the deceased who are in Sheol, not that the transfigured God-man Jesus could not speak to Elijah and Moses if they made an appearance on earth during Jesus' advent. There is a big difference. Not once does Jesus beseech and seek help from Elijah, Moses, or any other saint in heaven while on earth, as he actually does in reference to the Father numerous times. Unquote. James Y. also states, in his article, A Brief Comment on the Communion of Saints and Catholic Blogger Devman, he says, quote, are we seriously to believe that the unique, one-of-a-kind event of the transfiguration itself is a meaningful foundation for communication with those who have passed from this life? Do I really need to point out that there is actually no example of communication between the apostles and Moses and Elijah, that it is limited to Jesus, and hence would not, even if it was pressed far out of its meaningful content, support such a concept? Unquote. There has been a suggestion that Mary herself possesses not omnipresence, but instead had by the ability of bilocation. And for those who are unaware of what bilocation is, this is how it's defined on the new advent.org. This is bilocation. Quote, the question whether the same finite being, especially a body, can be in two bilocation or more replication, multilocation, Totally different places grew out of the Catholic doctrine on the Eucharist. According to this, Christ is truly 
really and substantially present in every consecrated host, wherever soever located. In the endeavour to connect this fact of faith with the other conceptions of the Catholic mind, theologians make the following distinctions, unquote. And also here, quote, that by location, multi-location is physically impossible. That is contrary to all the conditions of matter at present known to us, is the pr practically unanimous teaching of Catholic philosophers in accordance with universal experience and natural science. As to the absolute or metaphysical impossibility, that is, whether by location involves an intrinsic contradiction, so that by no exertion even of omnipotence could the same body be at once in wholly different places, to this question the foregoing distinctions are pertinent." Unquote. You can read the article on the subject of bilocation for more information in the description below. I also direct you to my article, Shoehorning the Roman Doctrines into Scripture, More Arguments to Address, where I respond to Quinn QVI, who is the one who made this claim. He's also known as XGame or XM Flash. You can find his comments on the article itself. To what I say in response is, there is no evidence of any person or any individual in scripture being granted multi-presence or even possessing multi-presence. Satan and his demons are a threat to all Christians. Satan's not the only threat. Satan cannot be in more than one place at one time, and even granting multi-presence as an argument for Mary and the saints being prayed to, nothing from scripture can be offered, and Satan being the god of this world in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, refers to Satan simply having dominion and power over the whole world. It is not suggesting that he has the power of multi-presence. Now, can anyone show me biblically where Mary is granted the attribute of multi-presence? No. Such thinking can't be shown. Mary is in heaven with the believers. She is not going to be aware of what is transpiring on the earth since she, she is in heaven with the Lord. Even if she possessed multi-presence, she wouldn't be able to hear the prayers of men, since to this world she is dead and cannot communicate to us. Someone who is living in a state of eternal bliss with Jesus in heaven is not going to be aware of what is going on on the earth anyway. Why would they be fixated on the troubles of this world when they're living in the path of eternal joy with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in heaven? Now, the subject of saintly intercession in Judaism wasn't something I was aware of until I had looked into it for two reasons. First, I had no idea it existed until I'd looked. And two, it wasn't relevant to the responses to rabbinic Judaism that I was doing. If you observe my videos and my papers on Judaism, not once does the issue of saintly intercession ever arise. Why raise a point? to someone when it is not relevant to the topic itself. In all my articles, you can search them from beginning to end, all my articles on Judaism that is, not once does the issue of saintly intercession come up. It wasn't important at the time they were written, and still isn't important to speak about with respect to proving Jesus to be the Messiah and Yahweh God. But I digress. However, even granting the view of saintly intercession that Orthodox Jews hold to, which Quinn QVI appeals to in the quotes that I provide in the article, appealing to the saintly intercession of Rabbinic Judaism doesn't work. If you pray to a saint and ask for their intercession, it is necromancy, no matter how much you want to try and get around the issue. Communication with the dead, for any reason, I don't care if it's for the sake of talking to them or asking for their intercession. Communication with the dead, for any reason, is necromancy. And no, the Transfiguration, as already pointed out, is not a counterexample. There is nothing wrong with those being exalted to sainthood. That's not disputable. Though, to be fair, in the context of the New Testament, every true believer is a saint. But getting back to the serious point, it is st still not a justification to pray to a saint or seek intercession from a saint, let alone from Mary. The rabbinic Jews, assuming they're doing what the Catholics are doing, 
have no biblical basis for it, and I wouldn't mind seeing the Old Testament justification for it. And so far, I'm not convinced. And also, if there are any rabbinic Jews watching this video right now, or reading the article, Shoehorning Roman Doctrines, let me know if you think the understanding presented by the Roman Catholics are the same as yours or not, because I do not want to be guilty of misrepresenting Judaism on that point, or attribute something false to Judaism which they do not teach. But anyway, need I say more? It's obvious and clear that one cannot prove biblically that these doctrines of Mary actually exist. While the Roman Catholics may accuse me of hating Mary, this isn't so. I don't hate her, I'm just putting her back in her proper place. Perhaps it is you who should be asking if what you're doing may be something that Mary is going to see on Judgment Day is something that actually makes her physically ill or upset. Perhaps that's her suggestion. For more information on these issues, and, and information on church history and church fathers, which will not be covered here, I suggest reading Keith Thompson's articles on the subject, and the talk by William Webster, which I presented earlier. Thank you for taking the time to watch the video.